Who inspired you to do the work that you've done in your career? What about y'all? Who inspired you to do the work that you've done? Growing up, I had a great example of what I thought a thoroughly educated, well-accomplished person should look like. It was my dad. He was an architect, an engineer, a physicist, a farmer, a builder, an entrepreneur. He could do anything. He even built his own house, designed it too. Every board he cut with his own hands, every nail he drove with his own hands. He was the owner, accountant, and mechanic for the businesses that he built from the ground up, businesses that have provided for our family for over 50 years and given him the opportunity to do the work that he loves. Growing up, there was never a repairman on speed dial. My dad, he was always the help desk and the support technician. Those of us that think, well, I really don't need the instructions. Let's be real, you know who you are, right? My dad was not one of those guys. He always sought to understand how and why something worked the way it did. He never accepted that it did it just because. And because of that, he had the ability to create, to innovate. He could create things like this bowl made out of black walnut. And he could do it with a machine that looked like this. Now, if I asked you what you could do with an old lawnmower motor, uh, some scrap metal, and a few pulleys, You'd probably say, Peyton, I'd take it to the dump. <laughs> I really doubt you would say, I'm going to create a machine that looks like it's about to hurl a large wooden block at me at a very high rate of speed. <laughs> right? no. My dad, he had a different vision. With that same list of ingredients, he saw the potential to create something that could create this bowl. A process that would usually take hours to do, he saw the potential to do it in 30 seconds. To make that machine, you would need a team of engineers, physicists, mathematicians. They would have to rely on a sophisticated computer system to design and build it. My dad, he walked out to a pile of scrap parts with a pencil and a piece of paper. And through his imagination, his knowledge, and his skill, he created that. He made that bowl. He was the physicist. He was the engineer. He was the mathematician, and he was also the welder, the woodworker, and the mechanic. Right? My dad, he did it all, and he was exceptional at every step of the way. And he did all that with a high school diploma. Now, how could someone with a high school diploma be all of those things? It's simple. For his entire life, my dad has been hungry to learn every skill that he possibly could. There were no limitations for him. His knowledge and skill could overcome just about any obstacle. And growing up, seeing that, Man, I wanted to be like my dad, literally able to create and build my future with my own two hands. So when it came time to go to high school, I was excited because they had classes like masonry and horticulture. I was going to get to learn and master the skills that I'd seen my dad showcase for all of his life. But the rest of society didn't seem as excited as I was about me taking those classes. You see, society had been telling all of my fellow students and I that you really need to get a four-year degree if you want to be successful. We were rarely asked, what do you want to do when you graduate? But every day we were asked, where do you want to go to college? It seemed like that was the expectation. And that story really started back in the 1970s and 80s when someone decided that we needed to tell every student they should work smarter and not harder. And there's nothing wrong with that until that story morphed into the infomercial that we hear today of... The only path to success, respect, and real education is a four-year degree. Cue cheesy smile, right? <laughs> now, as I travel across the country, I see teachers, administrators, guidance counselors at every level of education telling students that the only path to success is a four-year education. The only path to job opportunity, the only path to financial reward. Growing up in my community, there were a lot of people that I respected, that were successful, that had followed that path. They seem to be walking proof that the story was true. However, as I look at the job market today, as I reflect on my dad and what he was able to do with a high school diploma, I realize that there's more to the story than one fairy tale ending that doesn't necessarily fit for everyone, that doesn't offer the same guarantees that it once did. There's more to the story. When we think about that story, I look at 
I look at society today, I still hear that message. I still see the people. I think about the fact that when you walk into a high school classroom and you look at the banners that are hanging around the walls, those banners don't celebrate skill like this. They celebrate four-year education. The job market today is different than it's ever been. Just a few months ago, I was talking to an industrial contractor. He said, right now, we're looking for welders. They have three certifications. They can easily get that in two years at a community college, two years. We're going to pay those welders sixty dollars to $80,000 a year. Can you imagine being 20 years old, making eighty grand a year with little to no student debt? Is anyone else thinking about a career change right now? <laughs> uh, really, really. <laughs> $80,000 a year. I know a lot of four-year graduates that don't make eighty grand a year, myself included. As a matter of fact, the average four-year graduate is going to bring home about $43,000 a year. Right? This year, when we look at the number of students that are going to walk across the stage here in just a few months in May, 1.8 million people are going to walk out with a four-year degree. Half of them are going to go into jobs that don't require a degree at all. At Wake Technical Community College, right now, there are 15,000 students enrolled who already have a four-year degree. That's 22% of the entire enrollment. Wake Technical Community College is the largest graduate school in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Think about that. So why is that? What does that tell us about education and where we are? Well, that tells us that there's a severe gap between the education attained and the degree received and the skills that are needed in the workplace. That is a severe gap that's going to have a huge economic impact on our country. And that is a gap that we need to know and be aware of is the skills gap. The skills gap is affecting all of us. Everything that we purchased, the cars that we drove to get here, uh, the building that we're in right now, the telecommunications networks that we depend on to communicate and tweet about the skills gap, thank you, after this talk is over with, right? All of that is dependent upon the cost and availability of skilled labor. This clicker is dependent upon the cost and availability of skilled labor. So what is skilled labor? Well, someone with a skill is a craftsperson. They've received some specific technical training, and they have the ability to perform that skill to an exceptional degree. It includes the carpenters that frame the beams, Hung them in this building right now. The HVAC technicians that did the duct work that's keeping us cool right now. The cosmetologists did your hair this weekend. All of that is skilled labor. But for some reason, because that skilled labor doesn't come with a certain degree, we don't value it the same. Think about when you're walking downtown. You see someone in a business suit standing in front of the legislative building or an office building. What assumptions do you make about that person, about how well paid they are? about how successful they are, how well-educated they are. You turn the corner and you see someone wearing a hard hat and a tool belt. What assumptions do you make about them? How well-paid are they? How successful are they? How well-educated are they? Are your perceptions different? Which one of the two would you choose to be? When I described my dad as an architect and an engineer and then told you he's got a high school diploma, did your perception of him change? Now, let's be real. We know we have perceptions that are based off of people's occupations. Why is that? Because of the story we've been telling for the last 40 years. What impact does that have? Well, a politician visited one of the schools that I work with in the Charlotte area. He wanted to meet students that were graduating, so the principal assembled four of them together, and when asked what they were going to do after high school, the first one jumped up and said, I'm going to UNC, and I'm going to major in journalism. The second one, I'm going to NC State. I'm going to be an engineer. The third one, I'm heading to Duke and I'm going to major in philosophy. The fourth one stood there. Well, what are you going to do? I'm just going to the community college. Well, what do you want to do when you get there? Um, I'm just, just going to study heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. The principal jumped in real quick. Well, tell him why. Tell him why. I want to own my own HVAC business one day. This student who was passionate about working with his hands, who was an entrepreneur, who was going to start his own business and create jobs that would employ people, people that would make between $39,000 and $64,000 a year, by the way, the people who would put these HVAC ducts in here and keep you cool and keep you warm. Somehow, this student had heard the same story that's been told for the last 40 years and thought that his passion was not equivalent to that of his peers because it didn't include a four-year degree. That's one student. 
How does this play out in the workforce? The other day I was talking with a collision repair company. They're looking to grow their business here in North Carolina. They said if the skilled technicians were available, they could hire 440 skilled workers right now and grow their business by, get this, $250 million. Can you imagine the economic impact of employing 440 people and growing your business by $250 million? That is the impact of the skills gap. And that's just one company in one industry. Nationally, by 2017, we're going to be facing a skilled worker shortage of 2.5 million. Jobs that pay good living wages in advanced manufacturing, construction. By 2020, that number is going to balloon to 10 million skilled jobs going unfilled. That's more than the current number of people unemployed in this country right now. That's more than 1.8 million bachelor's degrees will ever be able to fill. We've got to start changing how we think about and how we value education. We've got to value skill attainment and academic attainment equally. Do we need the skills that come with a four-year degree? Well, yes, we do. I can remember growing up, whenever I get a piece of glass in my foot or a briar, my dad would come out and he'd take this folding knife out of his pocket. And when he unfolded it, <laughs> it looked like a medieval sword and it felt like one too. And he's like, hang on, boy, we're going to operate. I learned very early in life that, yes, we do need the skills that come with a four-year degree. <laughs> I need a doctor who can skillfully use a scalpel and not make me feel like my foot is being amputated, right? We need those things. But as much as we need that, we need the skills that come with a two-year degree, that come with a four-year apprenticeship program, that come with on-the-job training where my dad taught many young folks how to operate heavy equipment safely and effectively. Whether learning happens in the classroom or on the job site, the most important thing is that someone is learning something they didn't know before. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is education. And that education is even more valuable when it's able to be applied directly to how someone makes a living. We've got to value education differently. We've got to see skill and academics together. You know, how many of you have had that experience in the middle of the night where you had to make that emergency phone call to a plumber? All of a sudden, your toilet has had an identity crisis and decided it wanted to be a fountain, right? <laughs> no? We've all had to make that phone call. We've all got that list of numbers hanging on the fridge of people that we depend on who have skills that we don't possess. Those plumbers, the people that will fix those pipes, to them, that process is as easy as making chocolate milk. Or at least I thought making chocolate milk was easy. I walked into a university library at the cafe one day and ordered a glass of chocolate milk. The young college barista behind the counter said, Sir, we don't have chocolate milk. I found this odd because directly behind them was a gallon of whole milk and a bottle of chocolate syrup. <laughs> can, can you make it? No, sir, it's not even in the computer system. <laughs> okay, see what you can do. So he goes back, huddles up with a couple other people that are working there. All of a sudden, the huddle breaks. Uh, I see him clanking cups. There's steam rising. He comes back up to the front, proud smile on his face. Sir, here's your iced hot chocolate. Iced hot chocolate. He had made hot chocolate and put ice cubes in it. In my mind, that equation does not make chocolate milk. But to this day, every time I think about that cup of iced hot chocolate, <laughs> I have this realization that we have a lot of intelligent students in labs and classrooms across this country, no doubt. They're capable of doing amazing things. I mean, they can solve complex equations. They can create game-changing code. They can even help sequence the genome. It's unbelievable what they can do. But somewhere along the way, they've missed a very basic skill set. <laughs> Pretty basic, right? Somewhere in this process of teaching our students to work smarter and not harder, we forgot to teach them the skills that would actually empower them to do so. If we're ever going to have a shot at closing the skills gap and reducing its economic impact, we've got to start encouraging our students to think about education differently. We've got to encourage our students to be like my dad, a student of life, hungry to understand, not just ingest knowledge. We've got to value skill and academics equally. We've got to change what we consider advanced education. A master craftsman should be looked at the same as someone with a master's degree. 
We've got to encourage our students to explore the world with their hands so that they can learn through doing and learn what it is that they love to do. My challenge to you today is very simple. Change the story. Change the story that we tell ourselves about that skilled craftsperson working on the construction site. Change the story that we tell our children about what success looks like. We have to redefine success. Is success happily living out one's passion? Or is it being considered accomplished by the degrees that are hanging on a wall someone else built for you? We have to change the story. And my story? I decided to take that masonry class back in high school. And every day that I come home, I stand on a porch that is supported by the 16 brick columns that my father and I laid together. And every day as I stand on that porch and enjoy a glass of chocolate milk, <laughs> with every sip, I realize that skill is a part of my story. Skill is a part of your story. Skill builds our stories. I encourage you today as you leave here, go out, share a glass of chocolate milk with someone, and tell the story. Thank you. Thank you.